This course is about installing artificial grass. In it, we will discuss the supplies you need to install the project, a pre-installation checklist, how to prepare the area, how to install turf, how to create invisible seams within the turf area, and finally, how to finish up the installation by brushing in the infill material. Installing artificial grass is a fairly straightforward process, but there are some important details to keep in mind during the installation, for instance, the direction of the turf grain. These details can make a huge difference in the final appearance of the project. In this course, we'll walk through the process step by step so that your installation goes smoothly and the final product is clean, professional, and durable. Most of the tools necessary for installing artificial grass will be familiar to landscape contractors who have installed paver patios. To dig out the project area, you'll need picks, shovels, and a digging bar. Or, better yet, a sod cutter will make easy work of the initial tear out. Be sure to have grading rakes and wheelbarrows for transporting and spreading the crushed stone base. You'll also need a plate compactor or a hand tamp for smoothing out large areas of crushed stone to an even, smoothly graded surface. A plate compactor is strongly recommended for larger installation areas. To work with the fabric of the artificial grass, you'll need a utility knife with lots of extra blades. A ram set can also come in handy if you'll need to fasten the turf to a header board that is anchored into concrete at a sidewalk or driveway. Additionally, you'll need some specialty tools and supplies specific to artificial grass installation, including seaming cloth, seaming adhesive, and seaming staples. Make sure to check your plan so that you have enough of these to cover the needs of your project. A handful of half inch and three quarter inch PVC threaded caps and plugs will be handy to cap off any sprinkler heads. And one inch PVC or poly cap slash plugs will allow you to cap off an irrigation zone right at the valve. You will also need perimeter turf spikes. Plan on spiking the perimeter every four to six inches and every two to three inches for very tight curves. If you are installing in a pet area and need a sturdier border to prevent pets from pulling at the edges of the turf, you can use pressure treated 2x4s and 1.5 inch galvanized wood screws for the perimeter. Depending on what is surrounding the turf area, you may need border edging or bed dividers. Either bender board or composite edging and stakes. 3 8 inch crushed stone road base, also called chat or DG, is the best base for artificial turf. Plan on one yard for every 100 square feet of turf, which is enough stone for a 3 inch base layer. You will need to add more if you have plans for a deeper base layer. And of course you'll need enough artificial turf to cover the area and the recommended quantity of infill materials for the turf. Finally, a lawn drop spreader can help spread the infill material evenly over the turf. And you'll need a stiff bristled broom or power broom to brush the infill into the artificial grass. Always broom the infill into the turf against the grain of the turf blades. This will allow the blades to stand tall, supported by the infill material. Here's a quick checklist to review. Hand tools, you'll need picks, shovels, digging bars, grading rakes, hand tamps, wheelbarrows, utility knives with extra blades, a lawn drop spreader, and a stiff bristled broom. Power tools, a sod cutter or skid steer, plate compactor, ramset, and power broom. Consumables, crushed stone, artificial turf, seam tape, seam glue, seam staples, landscape spikes, infill, edging or bender board, treated 2x4s, and PVC caps for irrigation. In addition to gathering the tools and supplies necessary for the installation, there are several things to consider before you begin, including drainage, edging, heavy usage areas, and the orientation of the turf. Planning ahead to account for these elements of the installation will prevent costly mistakes, unnecessary work delays, and problems down the road. As with landscape installation, planning for proper drainage will protect the landscape and the architecture on site. When planning for the installation, 
Check the grading of the artificial grass location for low areas where the water might pool and cause problems associated with standing water. Also be on the lookout for areas where water might be running off from a downspout, a deck, or a patio. Installing drainage while preparing the location for turf doesn't increase the installation time that significantly, as you'll only need to do a little extra digging when preparing the area. And it will protect the new grass from potential water-related issues. The most important component of the installation when it comes to drainage is the crushed stone base. Three to four inches of crushed stone will allow water and other liquids to quickly drain through the turf and percolate into the soil, preventing standing water, excessive or rapid runoff, or other potential drainage hazards. Otherwise, drainage considerations are similar to those in any landscape installation. Catch basins should be placed under downspouts or in low areas in the turf to channel any standing water out of the turf area and either onto the street or into an area designated for drainage runoff. At low areas next to concrete or pavers, or in troughs in the installation location, channel drains can be used to divert runoff away from the turf area or out of the low spot. Be sure to install any drainage BEFORE installing the artificial grass. Digging up the turf to install drainage later is labor intensive and could damage the turf. It's important to think about the transitions between the area that will be covered in artificial turf and the surroundings, and to plan accordingly. If the turf will butt against concrete, patio pavers, flagstones, or an asphalt driveway, simply tacking the turf in place with perimeter spikes will create crisp, clean transitions. However, when working next to landscape beds, planters, or natural turf areas, creating a permanent border with edging will protect the integrity of the artificial grass area and keep the installation looking sharp. You can use bender board or composite edging with stakes to create the border. Be sure to measure the perimeter of these areas to ensure that you have enough edging on hand for your installation. High usage areas and pet areas require more attention to the seams and transitions because the additional wear and tear leaves the seams and edges more vulnerable than in a standard installation. When planning the installation, try to arrange the turf so that the seams are not located in the highest traffic areas. The best solution in these situations involves the use of treated 2x4s, which are arranged and secured before installation. The grass can then be screwed into the boards using 1.5 inch galvanized wood screws. This holds the turf firmly in place even if Fido starts pulling at the edges. Fido? Who has a dog named Fido? Who wrote the script? Whatever. The orientation of the turf is perhaps the single biggest factor that separates a professional looking installation from an amateur one. Artificial grass has a grain, which means that it looks different from different directions. If the grain of the pieces aren't all going the same direction, the installation will appear mismatched and sloppy. When laying out the turf, you'll notice that the blades lay in one direction. This is the grain. The tricky thing about the grain is that if it is not exactly matched, that is, if a seam is made with two pieces at even a slight angle to one another, you'll be able to see the location of the seam. In order to prevent this from happening, the first thing to do is to decide on the orientation of the grain. The grass looks best when the grain is facing the viewer. You'll probably want to arrange the grass so that the grain faces the street in a front yard installation and the house in a backyard installation. That being said, once the infill is laid down and the grass has been thoroughly brushed, the grass blades will stand up straight and the grass will look good from all directions. So if you need to adjust the orientation for other reasons, the end result will still look good. When creating a seam, make sure the seam is straight and that you follow the stitching on the underside of the fabric. This will ensure that the grain matches exactly. We'll talk more about the specifics of cutting and securing the seam a bit later in the course. Next, plan on arranging the turf so that there are as few seams as possible. It's more cost effective in the long run to use extra turf than spend the time piecing together scraps with lots of seams. Artificial grass is ordered by the square foot and generally comes in a 15 foot wide roll. When determining how the turf will be laid out in the project area, you'll need to consider how to fully cover the area with pieces of turf with matching grain.
Let us pause for a moment to consider a couple of examples about how to arrange the seams to efficiently cover an artificial turf area. Suppose you are planning to cover a bean-shaped area that is 27 feet long, 13 feet wide at its narrowest point, and 18 feet wide at its widest point. What would be the most effective way to arrange the turf to cover the area? It might seem like a good idea to lay out the turf over the 27 foot length of the area, leaving only Le Bulge on the left side to still be covered with turf. In this example, a thin sliver 3 foot wide and 13 feet long. In the hope of saving some money, one might be inclined to cut off 3 feet from the 15 foot roll and use it to cover the excess area. But this won't work, because the grain of the cut piece won't match the grain of the main piece. In order to finish the job with this start, you will actually need 13 more feet of the 15 foot roll just to match the grain of the original piece, leading to a large quantity of scrap turf. Using this plan, there's only one seam and you'll need about 600 square feet of turf. There's a much better way to cover this area, and that would be to turn the turf in the opposite direction, using two shorter pieces and a single seam down the middle. The seam here is about the same size, but the installation only requires about 540 feet of turf. That's about 10% less than the alternative, my friend. The key thing to confirm before getting started is that you have enough turf to completely cover the area. Providing ample material with the grain going in the right direction for seaming, so that all the areas have exactly the same grain direction. Leaving the seams invisible and creating a turf area with a consistent optical appearance. Over time, as with pavers, carpeting, and wood flooring, turf has subtle changes in color due to slight changes in dye lots. Therefore, it is key to make sure that there is enough turf material ordered to assure the job is supplied with turf of the same dye lot. As with any installation project that involves digging, be sure to call 811 or the utility companies in your area to locate all of the utilities on site. Let's review. Your pre-installation checklist includes planning for drainage, edging, high usage areas, and turf orientation in addition to calling to locate utilities before you start construction. I'm serious, you ever struck a sewer line? Super gross. Ugh. When you arrive on site with all of the materials you need and with all the special considerations taken into account, the first step is to prep the area. Begin by locating and removing or capping off all irrigation lines. You can locate the irrigation on site by turning it on at the clock and flagging the sprinkler heads. When possible, cap the project area's irrigation off at the valve for that zone and remove the pipes. If there are other sprinklers on the zone that should remain functional, you can cap off each additional sprinkler using PVC threaded caps or PVC threaded plugs. It's not a bad idea to test the irrigation system after you've capped off all of the relevant areas to make sure there aren't any leaks or hidden damage. Other things to look out for under the surface of the area you are preparing are utilities, landscape wiring, wiring for outdoor speakers, those often follow the edges of a landscaped area, existing drain tile, and other components of current landscaping. Plan to protect these components. For instance, move all wiring six inches or so away from the edges of your installation area to prevent them from being punctured by the landscape nails during installation. Install conduit or sleeving if there are potential additions to the landscaping in the future. Once you have accounted for all of the underground wiring and hazards, you can begin to remove the vegetation on site. I highly suggest using a sod cutter here. Far be it for me to tell you how to live your life though. One pass will remove the sod and a second pass will remove the remaining roots and soil necessary for installation. Should roots or natural thatch remain, you may need to go deeper. Typically, 3 to 4 inches of existing landscaping is removed. On larger jobs, a skid steer might be more efficient. It's important to remove all roots and other vegetation, which can cause uneven spots in the turf if left to decay under the road base. At this point, you can install drainage, conduit, and any other components that need to remain under the turf. 
This is also the time to install edging or bender board in areas where the project area borders natural turf or a landscape area. Also, if the area is a high usage or pet area, install the treated 2x4s along the perimeter of the project area. In areas where moles or gophers are a problem, you can install rodent wire to protect the turf from being damaged from underneath. Unroll the rodent wire and tack it into place with landscape staples. In order to create a seamless wire surface, maintain a one square overlap as you lay down each successive strip. Next, you'll need to spread 3 to 4 inches of gravel. Again, 3 8 crushed stone is the best gravel layer. It compacts well and provides adequate draining for the artificial turf. Use a plate compactor to achieve a smooth surface, avoiding abrupt mounds and divots. The surface does not need to be perfectly flat or straight, but it should be smooth, and contours should be shaped to direct water for proper drainage of the site. Pay attention to the relative height of the base layer, especially next to sidewalks, driveways, patios, or other hardscapes. The top of the grass should be half an inch to three quarter inches higher than any adjacent hardscape. Measure the height of the grass blade and subtract half an inch to determine how far below the top of the hardscape should reach. A smooth, slightly crowned grade gives the most natural appearance. Lightly wet the base layer and continue to pass the plate compactor over the base layer until you have reached the compaction rate of 90%. When dry, the project area should be smooth and firm to ensure that there are no unwanted bumps under the artificial grass. Alright, once the base is spread, compacted, and graded, properly aligned with the edging, and at the proper height next to hardscapes, you are ready to install the turf. Begin the turf installation by unrolling the turf on a flat surface, preferably in the sun, to acclimate the turf. Pull out any wrinkles or creases. Unrolling the turf and letting it sit for an hour or two before installation will make the turf easier to work with in the installation, and will give any wrinkles or creases time to relax before you fit the turf to the project area. Verify the measurements of the project area and the artificial grass to ensure a proper fit. Once the project area is ready, move the acclimated turf to the work area and stretch it over the prepared base layer. Installing artificial turf is a lot like installing carpet. It's important to stretch the turf over the entire area before tacking it down in order to prevent bubbles or wrinkles. Double check to make sure that the orientation of the grain is facing the correct direction before doing any cutting. Once the turf has been stretched over the installation area, it can be helpful to temporarily nail one side in place before beginning to cut. This will allow you to keep the turf area taut and smooth as you trim the opposite side. You should always cut from the underside of the turf. This prevents unnecessary damage to the blades and most efficiently uses the knife. For best results, use short cuts about 8 to 10 inches, especially along curved or wavy edges checking your progress frequently as you proceed. Exercise special care around hardscapes and flagstones to trim the turf so that it sits naturally against the landscape elements. You should always have lots of new, sharp cutting blades available when cutting so that you can frequently replace your blade and keep the trimming process moving along safely and effectively. You will also need to create seams before you finish cutting the turf fabric along the perimeter. We'll address seaming in its own section in a moment. Once the turf is cut to size, it's time to tack it down with turf spikes. Nail a spike into the turf every 4-6 to six inches along the perimeter, with spikes every 2-3 to three inches on very tight curves. When nailing in the spike, spread out the grass blades around the spike to prevent blades from getting stuck under the head of the spike. You can use an extra spike to help push the blades of the turf aside as you hammer in the spike. When securing the seams, use square seaming staples. Because the turf comes in 15 foot wide rolls, you shouldn't need additional staples in the middle to keep the turf in place. The seams and edge spikes will be sufficient to prevent any movement. For pet yards, it's best to secure the perimeter with 1.5 inch galvanized screws attached to the treated 2x4s you secured in place while preparing the base. 
Once again, place a screw every 4 to 6 inches and every 2 to 3 inches for very tight curves. In cases where there are dogs who may dig very aggressively, use a ram set to fasten the header board to concrete at a sidewalk or driveway. For use with pets, it's a good idea to leave the sprinkler system in place. This will allow you to easily rinse off the turf periodically to avoid that kind of urine -y smell. You know the one I'm talking about. After the turf has been secured, check again to make sure that the sprinkler system is operating properly and that all landscape lighting, outdoor speakers, and any other landscape features are functional. Verifying that everything works and that there are no punctured pipes or wires before installing the infill. Now the process of creating seams is tricky because two things can go wrong that will have a severe impact on the overall appearance of the installation. Number one, if the grain is not properly aligned, the seam will be visible and the turf area will not look like a coherent hole. And number two, if there is a gap or an overlap, or if the two edges of the turf area aren't properly lined up, there can be a bunching or bare spots and it won't wear well. In order to avoid these problems, seaming should be done in the following way. First, work along straight edges and make sure that the grain is going in the proper direction. If you look on the underside of the turf, you will see lines that look like stitching. You will need to align the seam in the direction of this stitching. To prepare the two pieces of material for seaming, the first thing to do is to cut the edge in the proper location for the seam. When preparing to cut the material, you'll need to be looking at two pieces of turf, one on your left and the other piece at your right. Begin on the left side. Roll over the edge and cut the seam along the outside edge of the stitching so that there is no excess backing on the seam side of the cut. Once you've completed the cutting on this side, turn to the section of turf on your right. On this side of the turf, you will be cutting along the inside edge of the stitching so that there is the same amount of backing as there is between the two rows of stitching, on the seam side of the cut. This means that on one side of the seam, there is no extra backing. On the other side of the seam, the backing creates the interval standard for the turf. So, when the two sides are matched together along the seam, there is no interruption in the regular distance between rows of stitching. This will ensure that the spacing of the rows of grass blades along the seam is exactly the same as the spacing of the rows of grass blades throughout the rest of the turf, preventing unevenness, bunching, or other irregularities along the seam. If you simply eyeball the distance and try to cut halfway between the rows, you are more than likely to get small inconsistencies in the backing distance that will cause the fabric not to line up properly and that will cause wrinkles or bunching in the grass. Once the turf is cut and ready to be seamed, line up the two pieces being seamed together so that the edges of the turf precisely match each other and are smoothed out to cover the desired turf area. When the two sides of the seam are in place, secure each side by driving turf spikes approximately 6 inches from the seam edge, placing them every 6 to 8 inches along the seam. This secures the turf in place, so you can fold back the turf edges along the seam. Hold them in place with spikes and lay down the seam tape between them. Connecting the two pieces of turf with seam tape is important because it prevents uneven wear and potential weed growth along the seam. Pour the seam glue onto the strip of seam tape and then spread it evenly over the width of the tape. A seam staple wrapped with duct tape serves as an inexpensive glue spreader. Now, be sure not to get any glue or anything else that has touched the glue come into contact with the grass blades. Simply fold the turf back over the seam tape and secure the seam in place with square seaming staples. When inserting the staples, use other staples or turf spikes to fold back the grass blades and ensure that none get bent over and caught underneath the staple. In some situations, you may need to cut and seam perpendicular to the stitch rows on the back of the turf. This is called a butt seam. You will follow the same guidelines as a regular seam, but instead of cutting along the stitching, you will cut between the stitches on the back of the turf. When butting the turf up to the adjacent turf section, align the stitch rows so that the rows continue through the seam so the seam remains hidden. We went over a lot there, but let's review. 
When you have aligned the pieces of turf to be seamed, begin by cutting the turf on either side of the seam. Cut one side on the outside edge of the stitching and the other on the inside edge. Line up the turf, secure with turf spikes, and roll it back. Lay down the seam tape and spread the seam glue. Fold the turf into place and secure it with staples. The final step in your installation is the spreading and brushing in of the infill. Infill varies from application to application. The manufacturer recommends specific infill material and infill rates in pounds per square foot for each application. So, be sure to check the specifications for your project. The infill, or layers of infill, helps the grass blades stand up and, depending on the application, may contain antibacterial or odor neutralizing properties. Now depending on the infill material, the infill may be done in one or two passes. You will need to complete the spreading of one layer of infill before spreading the second layer. Typically there are two components that must be applied in separate applications, silica sand and crumb rubber. Do not attempt to spread the infill when the infill material or the turf is wet. The moisture will cause clumping, lead to an uneven finish, it's just, it's just a whole mess. Because the infill material is so fine, it is best not to dump it in a single place and then attempt to spread it out from there. It is neither time effective nor effective in creating an even layer of infill. A lawn drop spreader is recommended to spread the infill evenly. Use a number 5 or other mid range setting and move the spreader steadily across the area. Now if you don't have a spreader, you can spread the infill by hand as evenly as possible over the area. Once you have spread a layer of infill over the project area, use a stiff bristle broom, often used for concrete work, or a power broom to work the infill material evenly into the grass blades. If you regularly install artificial grass, a power broom is a must. For each layer of infill, alternate spreading the material over the project area and brushing the infill into place. Once you have spread and brushed in the required amount of infill, lightly spray down the work area to remove any dust and dampen any static that might be on the lawn. Clean up the work site, making sure to remove all scrap turf, turf spikes, and staples that may have been left behind in the project area. Make sure you pick up all used utility knife blades. We've heard some horror stories folks, dogs get into it, it's just, just pick up after yourself, just like your mom taught you and finish by sweeping any stray infill material from adjacent hardscape surfaces back into the turf area. And then go get yourself a steak dinner. No, two steak dinners. You deserve it, trust me. Well, congratulations. You just completed the installation of your artificial grass project. All that's left to do now is collect payment for the job and let the homeowner enjoy their new, water-efficient, low-maintenance lawn.